Namaste. So chapter seven is another very technical, elaborate description, this time of the Antakarana. And first, Goddess Lakshmi reveals that she is the Antakarana. Huh? She calls herself the Antakaranakini. So she is basically the mind. And then she goes on to describe exactly how the mind is put together. Now, I don't know about you, <laughs> but I want to know how this mind is put together because the mind is very powerful. And if it's not understood properly and managed properly, then it can really run away with you. It can ruin your whole life. Because mind is not intelligent. Mind is a mechanism. Try to understand. It takes the inputs of the senses, recognizes them, relates them to I, the false ego, <laughs> and then presents them to the actual self, the kshetra the knower of the field. kshetra is described in Bhagavad Gita. You can look it up. Huh? You're a big boy now. You can look things up, right? And then we take an, a decision on that based on what we have clung to already in the past. And then we go into action, take action on it. So if this seems familiar to those of you who've been following this channel from the beginning, if there even is anybody besides me who's been following it from the beginning, way back in 2012, we did a series on the Buddha's teaching of the Mula Pariyaya Sutta. Ding. And you should watch this because it's a, a simplified version of exactly the same subject matter covered in this chapter by Lakshmi. So I think it's very interesting that the Buddha's suttas and the uh, tantras Vedic Tantras describe exactly the same thing. And, and Buddha even uses the term Antakarana because it was a very well-known term for a person's psyche. And somebody made a comment, is this Antakarana, is this the brain? <laughs> and no, the, the answer is no, no, this is not the brain. The brain is simply an interface. Huh? It's just like if I'm recording something on my computer, which is something I do just about every day. I have an interface. I, don't, I can't get sound directly into my computer. I have to have something to convert the analog sound waves to the digital information that the computer can handle. So this is called an analog to digital converter. And of course, on the output side, you have a digital to analog converter. It's an interface, that's all. It handles input output operations only. It has no really function of its own. It's just a transmitter and receiver, encoder and a decoder. Huh? It's not the brain. And the proof that it's not the brain is that the Antakarna is the principal part of the linga sharira, the subtle body. And the subtle body is really, well, we have five koshas, right? Anamaya kosha, the gross body. And then the other four koshas, the pranamaya kosha, manamaya kosha, vijnanamaya kosha, and anandamaya kosha are all part of the subtle body. And they, or it <laughs> survives the death of the external gross body and goes on to the next body. See? 
So this antakarna, this linga sharira, is made of something much more durable than this external body, because this body only lasts for maybe a century at the most. But the linga sharira is born again and again and again, as many times as necessary, in different bodies. And this is the process of reincarnation or transmigration. And this is the mechanism. And Lakshmi describes in this chapter exactly how it's all put together and how it works. She is like, she is like describing in, in great intricate detail the knot, huh? the trap, the, the lock on the cage. Huh? She's describing in great detail. But she's describing it in the descending way. The avaroha panta. See? She's describing it as the one in charge of the creation and how she has woven this intricate web of mental phenomena that keeps us entrapped in the material world. So as usual, you know, just like me, <laughs> she saves the best for last. Right at the end of the chapter, she says, Now I have described the descending process huh? and the ascending process, the aroha panta, is just the same thing in reverse. So you want to know how to get out of this trap? You want to know how to attain liberation? You have to just follow the same process in reverse. She says, as soon as you realize that this mind, intelligence, and consciousness are all myself alone, poof, they all dissolve. Huh? The material body, the mind, all this stuff, it just goes away because the principal thought that keeps them all together, the glue, is the thought of I. And as long as we believe in this abstraction, huh, this concoction called I, <laughs> then we cannot undo the knot that keeps us in material existence. So, but as soon as we realize, oh, it's not I, it's not me, it's Lakshmi, it's the goddess, it's Shakti. Huh? Then, ah, oh, okay, it all, it all gradually unravels. And by following the process of neti neti, we can easily see that this body is not it, the energy of the body is not it, the mind is not it, even the intelligence is not it. In fact, even consciousness is not it. That's all Shakti. So all the, the glue is, is taken out and the whole thing unravels and we're no longer entrapped. See, that's the ascending path following the same route that she describes in the descending path. And then she says, I become even more transparent huh, by continued contemplation along this line especially if one is taught by a realized spiritual master. Huh? She says that. Read, go back and read it. <laughs> that all of these things, these illusions of individuality and selfhood and agency and cause and effect and ownership and all of this nonsense that we burden ourselves with, goes away, it becomes transparent, and then only she is left. And in that way, we attain her nature, her status. And what is that? Huh? Brahman. 
So you see, when I said a long time ago that I'm dedicating this channel to the Sri Vidya, because by following, by worshiping the feet of the goddess, she will take you to the feet of Shiva. See? Or in this case, Narayan. <laughs> Two different names for the same thing. The unconditioned, limitless, all-powerful consciousness, or really awareness and beingness, that is the root of all existence. So those of you who have followed along on this channel for some time and maybe picked up a little mantra here and there, you know, or a new way of looking at things coming from the scriptures instead of from some nonsense scientist or psychologist or religionist or, you know, somebody who basically wants to keep you trapped somebody who wants to exploit your delusion huh? and profit from your ignorance. Huh? But we don't charge any money, you know. Uh, I mean, now YouTube is going to start forcing videos to have ads, which really sucks, and I'm against it. But what can I do? They, have, they own the, the playing field, so they make the rules. But we don't charge. And any money we receive from ads is going right to our program of feeding sadhus. So if ads start popping up here and there, don't blame me, all right? And we'll use it whatever income. And it's not much, you know. It's like a tenth of a cent per video or whatever. But anyway, these people who are only profit-minded, material profit-minded, are using you. And so they have an interest in keeping you in illusion. You see? You can't fool an honest man. Huh? That's the saying. You can't con an honest man. You can only con somebody who has some desire, some lust, some passion. See, because you can exploit that. You can dangle the object of their passion in front of their nose and they become irrational. They'll do any kind of stupid thing you want them to do with the promise of getting their object of passion, you see, their object of desire. So what happens if you realize that there's nothing in this world that's desirable? See? Except maybe, you know, the association of realized beings <laughs> and true knowledge coming from the scriptures. That's very desirable because it leads out, out of the trap, out of the self-delusion. See, other than that, everything else in this world is junk, is garbage, because it keeps you trapped. Try to understand the intensity of the emergency situation that we're in, you know? I mean, the whole thing in the U.S. is so indicative. There's this, you know, uh, global epidemic, pandemic, right? And the government is just, oh, well, you know, I don't take responsibility, you know. And so all these people are dying, you know. <laughs> Nobody's even willing to wear a mask, you know. It's crazy, right? They don't realize the intensity of the emergency. They don't realize how serious the situation is. And the same is true of the material world. People just blithely go on with their lives, you know, thinking everything's okay, I can relax, I can have fun, you know. Fun is basically useless activity. You know, that might be a little pleasurable. But it's a waste of time, money, energy, and, and so on. Because it doesn't lead to self-realization. And that is the overriding emergency situation that we're in. You know? It's like going out in a boat and the boat starts leaking. And you go around and you say, hey, the boat is leaking, the boat is leaking. And everybody goes, it's okay, we're on vacation. 
It's all good. It's just fun. See, so this is delusion. And this is what Lakshmi Tantra and the other scriptures that we cover here in are uh, designed to overcome, or to, rather to give you the tools to overcome it yourself by your sadhana. So that's what this is for. These are instructions for your sadhana and then how to overcome your attachment to this material world and attain complete enlightenment. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum.